How do you observe something you can't see? This is the basic question of somebody who's interested in finding and studying black holes. Because black holes are objects whose pull of gravity is so intense that nothing can escape it, not even light. So you can't see it directly. So my story today about black holes is about one particular black hole. I'm interested in finding whether or not there is a really massive, what we like to call supermassive black hole, at the center of our galaxy. And the reason this is interesting is that it gives us an opportunity to uh, prove whether or not these exotic objects really exist. And second, it gives us the opportunity to understand how these um, supermassive black holes interact with our environment and to understand how they affect the formation and evolution of the galaxies which they reside in. So, to begin with, we need to understand what a black hole is so we can understand the proof of a black hole. So what is a black hole? Well, in many ways, a black hole is an incredibly simple object because there are actually only three characteristics that you can describe. The mass, the spin, and the charge. And I'm going to only talk about the mass. So in that sense, it's a very simple object. But in another sense, it's an incredibly complicated object that we need relatively exotic physics to describe and in some sense represents the breakdown of our physical understanding of the universe. But today, the way I want you to understand a black hole for the proof of a black hole is to think of it as an object whose mass is confined to zero volume. So despite the fact that I'm going to talk to you about an object that's super massive, and I'm going to get to what that really means in a moment, it has no finite size. So this is a little tricky. But fortunately, there is a finite size that you can see. And that's known as the Schwarzschild radius. And that's named after the guy who recognized why it was such an important radius. This is a virtual radius, not reality. The black hole has no size. So why is it so important? It's important because it tells us that any object can become a black hole. That means you, your neighbor, your cell phone, the auditorium can become a black hole if you can figure out how to compress it down to the size of the Schwarzschild radius. At that point, what's going to happen? At that point, gravity wins. Gravity wins over all other known forces. And the object is forced to continue to collapse to an infinitely small object. And then it's a black hole. So if I were to compress the Earth down to the size of a sugar cube, it would become a black hole because the size of a sugar cube, it's a short shell radius. Now, the key here is to figure out what that short shield radius is. And it turns out that it's actually pretty simple to figure out. It depends only on the mass of the object. Bigger objects have bigger short shield radii. Smaller objects have smaller short shield radii. So if I were to take the sun and compress it down to the scale of the University of Oxford, it would become a black hole. So um, now we know what a short shield radius is, and it's actually quite a useful concept because it tells us not only when a black hole will form, but it also gives, up, gives us the key elements for the proof of a black hole. I only need two things. I need to understand the mass of the object I'm claiming is a black hole and what its short shield radius is. And since the mass determines the short shield radius, there's actually only one thing I really need to know. So my job in convincing you that there's a black hole um, is to show that there's some object that's confined to within its short shield uh, radius. And your job today is to be skeptical. <laughs> okay, so uh, <laughs> I'm going to talk about no ordinary black hole. I want to talk about supermassive black holes. So I want to say a few words about what an ordinary black hole is, as if there could be such a thing as an ordinary black hole. Well, an ordinary black hole is thought to be the end state of a really massive star's life. So if a star starts its life off with much more mass than the mass of the sun, it's going to end its life by exploding and leaving behind these beautiful supernova remnants that we see here. And inside that supernova remnant is going to be a little black hole that has a mass 
roughly three times the mass of the sun. On an astronomical scale, that's a very small black hole. Now, what I want to talk about are the supermassive black holes, and the supermassive black holes are thought to reside at the center of galaxies. And this beautiful picture taken with Hubble Space Telescopes shows you that galaxies come in all shapes and sizes. There are big ones, there are little ones. Almost every object in that picture there is a galaxy. And there's a very nice、um, spiral up in the upper left, and there are a hundred billion stars in that galaxy, just to give you a sense of scale. And all the light that we see from a typical galaxy, which is what、uh, the kind Of galaxies that we're seeing here comes from the light from the stars. So we see the galaxy because of the starlight. Now there are a few relatively exotic galaxies. I like to call these the prima donna of the galaxy world because they're kind of showoffs, and we call them active galactic nuclei. And we call them that because their nucleus or their center are very active. So at the center there, that's actually where most of the starlight comes out from. And yet, what we actually see is light that can't be explained by the starlight. It's It's way more energetic, and in fact, in a few examples, it's like the ones that we're seeing here. There are also jets emanating out from the center. Again, a source of energy that's very difficult to explain if you just think that galaxies are composed of stars. So, what people have thought is that perhaps there are supermassive black holes onto which. Matter is falling onto, so you can't see the black hole itself, but you can convert the gravitational energy of the black hole into the light we see. So there's the thought that maybe supermassive black holes exist at the center of galaxies, but it's a kind of indirect ar-、uh, argument. Nonetheless, it's given rise to the notion that maybe it's not just these prima donnas that have the supermassive black holes, but rather all galaxies、uh, might harbor these supermassive black holes at their centers. And if that's the case, and this is an example of a normal galaxy. What we see is the starlight, and if there's a supermassive black hole, what we need to assume is that it's a black hole on a diet, because that's the way to suppress the energetic phenomena that we see in active galactic nuclei. If we're going to look for these stealth black holes at the center of galaxies,、um, the best place to look is in our own galaxy, our Milky Way. And this is a wide-field picture taken of the center of the Milky Way. And what we see is a line of stars, and that's because we live in a galaxy which is a flattened disk-like structure, and we live in the middle of it. So when we look towards the center, we see this plane, which defines the plane of the galaxy, or line that defines the plane of the galaxy. Now the advantage of studying our own galaxy is it's simply the closest example of the center of a galaxy that we're ever going to have because the next closest galaxy is a hundred times further away, so we can see far more detail in our galaxy than any place else. And as you'll see in a moment, the ability to see detail is key to this experiment. So, how do astronomers prove that there's a lot of mass inside a small volume, which is the job that I have to show you today? And the tool that we use is to watch the way stars orbit the black hole. Stars will orbit the black hole in the very same way that planets orbit the sun. It's the gravitational pull that makes these things orbit. If there were no massive objects, these things would go、um, flying off, or at least go on a much slower rate, because all that determines how they go around is 